for the first 10 seconds of this talk. You can go to sleep for a moment. Hello, my name is Grant Lightly. Uh, I am the arm, uh, or sorry, the device, device tree subsystem maintainer for the Linux kernel. And today I'm doing a, doing a presentation on the status of the device tree support for ARM. So this is actually a presentation that I've, well, I've done a presentation titled this many times over the last few years, but so much has happened in the last 12 months that this turns out to be an entirely different presentation. So first of all, to get started, uh, what I want to do with this presentation is I want to start with talking about where we were at a year, a year ago, where we're at now, and then go into what the, what the challenges are and what the changes will be in the next, uh, what, what we need to be working on for the next year. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there's, when it comes to the actual, what we need to be working on now, uh, the, what I can talk, I can talk about a lot of different technical topics, but I want to know what, if you're working on device tree, what are the questions, what are the things that, that you're needing help with. So, to start with, for what the device tree is, because this presentation, I've done this presentation several times, there's lots of documentation on what it is, so I don't want to get into the, uh, into a big summary of how the device tree works or what it is. There's lots that you can find on there. I've got a few links up there. You can also look up other presentations from ELC and ELCD. Go there. The short, the very short summary for device tree is it's a data structure. It's a blob of data passed from firmware to the kernel so that the kernel can discover it's what the hardware looks like at runtime instead of having to do it uh, instead of having to have it hard coded into the kernel. So, let me set the stage and talk about where things were at a year ago. Uh, a year ago, I had been working on Device Tree for a while. I think I had been, became the maintainer, the official maintainer of it the year before. And I had spent a lot of time with some other engineers generalizing it to the point that it could be selected by pretty much any architecture in the kernel with just a few, uh, a few symbols added. It also included the four of the architectures you could already select it. Uh, Microblaze, MIPS, PowerPC, and Spark all had device tree support. Power, of course, being the architecture where it originally came from. Spark did not, is not where the support came from, right? Because PowerPC, Ben Schmidt did a lot of the work and uh, Paul, uh, Paul McCarris to actually write the substitute, <coughs> and then Dave Miller took it and used it for Spark, although the model is a little bit different. There were patches. Patches exist, existed to turn it on for ARM and x86. Uh, so, you know, that's, and I had been working towards that, trying to bring up board support to, to get it working. But there was still a great big question mark on whether or not ARM, a device tree on ARM was actually going to gain any traction. Uh, Russell King, the ARM maintainer, was definitely leery of it. He wasn't sure that it was the right decision to make. And several of the ARM sub-architecture maintainers were in the same position, that they weren't sure you know, whether or not device tree was the right solution. So then the question that has to be asked is, is why? Why, would, why was there a little bit of controversy between the, the two platforms? between using device tree and not. Well, the reality is, is that when it comes to bringing up hardware, or bringing up Linux on new hardware, the by far the easiest way still remains to take something that already works, clone it, have on it for a while until it seems to look right or work right, and then ship that, which is you know, effective for getting something working, but it has all sorts of other problems that go along with it. Uh, here's, this, this email highlights one of the problems. And this email was in response to a thread that was started by Linus earlier uh, about lamenting the ARM architecture. But you'll take a look here. If you look at the percentages of the underlying one that I have there, this is the changes between 2639 RC1. So this is pretty much what was, uh, what had already been merged for what was to become 3.0 and what was queued up for 3.1. And it was huge compared to all the other architectures. If you go into the kernel source tree and just do a look at the, 
ARCH ARM directory compared to ARCH x86, the ARCH ARM directory is far larger than any of the other architectures. In fact, I think it's larger than any of the other architectures combined. Uh, it's not quite that large, but it's, it's still really big. Um, so what is what happens, what we've what we the problem that we found ourselves in is we've got a lot of code that we do, need to support. Uh, the, the, the Arch Arm directory had, ended up filling up with what we call those board files. So these are just C files, so that every single new board that's added, most of you in this room are probably familiar with them, you just add another C file that adds all the initialization code. The problem is that, first of all, besides the huge code size that I showed earlier on the last slide, it doesn't scale. From a maintainership and a long-term perspective, it really doesn't scale. You've got problems with duplicate code that you now have cut, you know, the cut and paste problem. And so if you change, if you fix the bug in one piece of code, you have to go and find old places that have cut and pasted and do the same bug fix there. Uh, and it really doesn't scale for multi-platform. And the, what we have found in the ARM community is we no longer have the luxury of doing the easiest way to get Linux up and running on a system. We have an absolutely huge deployed our installed user base. And we need to support a huge number of boards. We can't just keep doing it the same way. We have to find ways to consolidate and make it easier to bring out new boards without <coughs> changing the kernel to do so. There's, I would even make the argument that in the next few years, we're going to start seeing pressure from the mobile market as things like our Android phones are looking more and more like general purpose computing platforms. A lot of ways they're starting to replace our PCs. I can, uh, it's not a huge leap to foresee that cell phones or handsets are going to, there's going to be an economic pressure to actually make, look, make those look like general purpose platforms where the end user can install their own, uh, their own operating system on it. And we can't do that if we don't have a platform that supports that. So device tree ends up being part of that. So this debate went on for quite a while with no real resolution. I continue to work on the, the device support. We continue to get a debate on the mailing list on whether or not it was a good idea. And the tipping point in the whole argument seemed to be this email. This was the email, and I apologize for the OMAP guys that are in this room. I'm not picking on you, and honestly, neither was Linus. But that's the one, this is the email that kicked off a huge thread talking about the ARM architecture and the way that it was supported in the kernel. The email that Russell had sent showing the lines of code was also in response to this. And so what Linus has said is, guys, this whole ARM thing is a pain. You need to stop stepping on each other's toes. There's no way that your changes to those crazy clock data files should constantly result in those annoying conflicts. This thread then continued on to the, uh, we talked, or in this thread was debating the value of having a having a platform and consolidating code down to this. But under the threat of, well, I'll just back up there for a moment. What it came down to, what this email kicked off, is under the threat of the possibility that we would no longer be able to get new board support and new platform support into the Linux mainline kernel, the ARM community started to consolidate and started to, there was real momentum around a lot of the effort that Lenaro and some of the other players had been building on trying to uh, consolidate and integrate the, the ARM architecture work. And device tree was a really big part of this. So that allows me to put up this slide, which is pretty much where we get to today. Uh, on April 28th was the commit that actually turned on ARM support, and Russell asked for the 3.1, or sorry, for the 3.0 version. <coughs> Russell asked Linus to pull this. And this kicked off, it got rid of all the uncertainty over would device tree be used or would not be. Was it worthwhile spending the effort, spending all the time required to do a device tree port if there was uncertainty about whether or not it was going to get to mainline? Well, now it's in mainline, people can start working on it. In uh, 3.1 kernel, we saw uh, four platforms with actual board support. Uh, it was very trivial just the basic enough to get the infrastructure up and running so you could pass the device tree to the kernel, use it to identify the device, 
and uh, have, has information about memory and a few other little details. It didn't get into some of the more interesting things like registering devices or looking at clocks or any of that, but it gets, you know, it started the momentum. And two of these platforms are particularly interesting in that Prima 2 and the Xilinx Zinc platform were brand new platforms in the kernel. And those two are device tree only. So they don't even support the legacy A tags. Uh, the other thing that happened, we already had some momentum in U-Boot, because U-Boot already has device, had device tree support for quite a few years. And so now, currently in U-Boot, I think the majority of the OMAP platforms, Tegra, uh, Samsung, I didn't go and look at the actual list, but there's quite a few platforms that if you go into U-Boot sources and look for config OF the FTT, you'll see exactly ones that are using it. And it's easy. If you want to use it on your platform you're using U-Boot, just to find config OF the FTT. And that's enough to, to get up and running so that you can pass the device feed to the kernel. So we're done, right? Well, no, this is actually just the starting point. The, now that we've got the basic board support and the infrastructure in place, now begins the hard work and the, what will be a long-term process of building up the board support and building up the bindings that are required for, uh, to describe the modern systems. This is going to take a lot of years. I mean, we've got right now the basic support so that we can register platform devices, IC devices, SPI devices. All that exists, it's nice and generic, and just by turning it on, you can immediately start populating your device tree data file with it. But it doesn't touch any of the, the more complicated things. Uh, with the new ARM SSEs that are coming out, there are, we have to be dealing with pin control, which is, uh, oh, we'll get to that in a moment, but we have to deal with clocks. That we have complex <coughs> clock trees in the kernel, and we have to be able to model the dependencies between them so that generic clock device drivers will work with more than one platform. There's questions about the power domain, there's questions about power management. How do we teach the kernel, if we're no longer writing C code in org files, how do we teach the kernel to behave intelligently on power management events when the data, most of the data in the tree is just describing the actual devices and how they're linked, to, linked together? There's regulators end up being very much the same thing. Uh, you've got power supply regulators. They look a lot like clocks in that you've got sources and sinks, but you have to figure out a way to, to describe them. And these are all actually quite hard problems. Not because it's hard to figure out a data format for putting them into the device tree file, but what ends up being difficult and requires a lot of work is figuring out how to do this in a way that's actually beneficial for the ARM community as a whole, or for the embedded community as a whole. Because if we start defining new bindings and new ways of describing how the platform is put together, and those new bindings are either, well, hugely verbose and hard to maintain, or are hard for engineers to get their head around, or uh, don't adequately model the system, we're going to end up problems a year from now with bindings and data descriptions that are completely useless and make it even harder to bring up new hardware than it was before, and then we've lost. But I'll give you an example here. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, um, an excerpt from an email that uh, Linus Wolge had sent. Linus has done some fantastic work on the the ARM on consolidating ARM code, and he's specifically been looking at pin mux or pin control. This is the case where. There's so many devices on the new SOCs, we just can't physically get the signals out of all the pins of the, the box. And most SOCs now have some form of remapper or mapping function that allows each device to be connected to one or more of the pins on the physical package of the chip. But this is hard. I mean, one way to handle it is to say, Linux shouldn't deal with this at all. Let's just punch and make firmware set it up, and then when we get into Linux, we're going to be good. We'll just use whatever it's been set up. Which, you know, uh, for the power PC systems that I've worked on, that worked really well. You know, we set it up to leave it alone. Now throw into that mix power management. 
and the fact that we have systems that either needs to change the state of the pin control when the system goes into suspense so that we don't continue leaking a half a watt just because the device is still powered up attached to it. Uh, we have to change modes. There is, uh, I know one example on Tegra, where they have one I2C controller, but they've got two I2C buses, one attached to each of the pin groups that are on the, SS, on the SSC. And so in this picture, you may have one of the groups you know, I2C on two of the sections here, and they actually switch it around at runtime. Well, how do you describe that to the kernel? How do you describe in a data structure how to to say that I have this pin, this this set of pins and this set of pins, but I need Linux to switch between them depending on which bus you're actually talking about. Okay, so yes, with uh, some of the newer systems like uh, like OMAP, and there you've got more than one device on, or sorry, you've got more than one core. You've got the core that Linux runs on, and then you've got all these DSPs or M3 cores that are running other applications, and you need to be able to describe this, how to switch these back and forth. <coughs> well, so what, what does this end up looking like? The initial attempt at trying to create a binding and squirt into the device tree source file, the DTS files, a description of how PIN should be set up. And this isn't even dynamic PIN configuration. This is just trying to describe the static configuration that should be set up at runtime. As you can see here, just for very, very basic PIN control, nothing exciting, we were adding 800 lines to the DTS file. I think that ended up also turning up to be 4K, something like that. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a huge amount of data that, you know, when we're talking about multi-megabyte memory systems, but we don't want to be bloating the device tree unnecessarily, and we don't want to be coming up with data structures that are unmaintainable. So, you know, for our first half, first the, the, the 800 lines here are replacing 200 lines of C code. Have we won? Uh, maybe not. Surely we can do better, but it, it's, it, it requires some good engineering and good, uh, good taste in design to figure out what this should be. The other question that rightly comes up is you've got trying to decide what the right mix is between the stuff that we still hard code into the kernel and what we put into the DTS files. Uh, I'm going to use OMAP as an example again because they have this, they have this very lovely system of uh, they call it hardware mod, where they've got data tables that have been generated from the hardware design documents, or sorry, the hardware design of the chip that gives information about things like clock domains, how the clocks are routed to each other, how are domains, how to control them, in a, a lovely cardinal structure. And right now, if you take a look at the, the kernel source, So you end up with stuff like this. And most of this data was generated, put into the kernel, and we do the mass code from there. But it gives all the data about, about the chip. This is static data about the OMAP for SOC. So the question that is immediately comes up is, does this data belong in the kernel as these C files, or does it belong as data in the DTS file, in the device tree? source file, which then gets passed into the kernel at boot time. And there's good arguments for both. On one side of the argument is to get it out of the kernel, you get, you keep, you preserve this data so that the kernel doesn't have to have it. It doesn't need to keep it in its binary image. I think it was, it ends up being uh, 20, uh, 26K of the, the hardware mod data. It's, it's fairly large. Uh, well. Is it's not hugely large, but it's not insignificant either. So we can keep it in the kernel, and that means if you do a multi-platform kernel, if you support OMAP for each OMAP SOC, you have to have a copy of this data. 
The other option is you get out of the tree so that you don't have to pass, so the kernel image doesn't have to have any passes in the device tree. But that makes the device tree bigger and it means that you need to uh, be happy with the binding that gets put in there. Because once we put, move it over to the device tree, we want to have a little bit more control over the format of the data. We don't have as much flexibility to change the format if it turns out that the format that we choose chose the device tree doesn't quite capture the model effectively. These are just hard problems. There's no way around it. They're hard problems. It's necessary because we don't have the luxury of doing things the way we used to. <coughs> we want to go to multi-platform. We want to do the single Z image stuff that, uh, that's the other focus of the ARM community right now. So we have to deal with it. And I've just lost my place because there we go. So, given that, so, uh, what I'd like to say now, there's lots of things that I could talk about, and I'd like to get questions from that. But first, what I want to do is, for those of you who are actually looking at going to need to be using Device Tree, there's the current code that is in, or that will be 3.2, uh, has pretty much everything that you need in it to get started with Device Tree with very low impact, without even having to change your bootloader. And I've got a, a demonstration of, of how to do that here. But to get started, all you need to do on an ARM platform is you need to enable config OF. Uh, you need to get a device tree blob to the kernel in some manner. There's two ways to do this. One is you ask your firmware to do it by turning it on in U-boot or whatever other firmware you have. If you don't have U-boot and you want to be working with device tree, there's a library called libfdt. It's in the device tree compiler. It's a source package. And that one is a BSD licensed library that anyone can pull into their firmware and use however they need to. It allows you to take an image and manipulate it. That's generally yes. That seems to be the, the model that makes the most sense, is to put the DTB on the file system with the kernel. One of the things that we don't want to get into the get trapped with is to end up with systems where we have no control over that device tree data. One of the one of the things that we've tried to do very much is have the policy that if something is wrong, like if if the data is wrong, let's fix the data. Let's design all of our processes and the way that we handle these device tree files so that we can change the data. Because otherwise, if the device tree data is actually burned into the firmware and is in a mode that we, that we can't change it, that we can't manipulate before it goes to the kernel, we're stuck. We have to, we have to consume the data that's provided by the board. Uh, and that means that we have to start with work code, work handling code in the kernel itself to support the bad device tree data. So if you put it onto the disk with the kernel, that alleviates a lot of that problem because we do have the option of, of updating it. There are still questions as to what actually is going to work for, di for distributions, so particularly on general purpose platforms. But for the embedded space, we've got a, a lot more flexibility because if we've got control of the hardware, we usually have control over the software stack that runs on it too. The other option is, uh, oops, the other option is to enable config OF DTB append. And there's a, another, another config signal symbol that goes along with that. I can show you that in KPIC. And what it will do is it just allows you to, when you build your Z image that you're going to boot on the kernel, you just concatenate the device tree, the compiled device tree file to the end of it, pass that to your, give that to your board, and when the Z image wrapper comes up, the first thing it will do is it will look to see if it's got a device tree blob appended to the end of it. If it does, it goes ahead and uses it. If it doesn't, it boots in the old mode. By the way, that's something also that has been really important in the way that we've been migrating to device tree. At no point should the migration to device tree break, exist, break existing board support. Turning on config OF does not turn off the way that you're booting your system right now. So if you're playing with it and you're working with it, you should always be able to boot a kernel with device, a device tree enabled kernel without passing it the device tree and it'll pass the old way so that you can build one kernel and test it both passing a device tree and not, and when you have problems with one, with, with the device tree migration, you can do a comparison to see what has changed. 
We still want to remove the board file, but it gives us a window where you can turn on device tree support, get it stable and up to snuff uh, so that you're happy with it before removing the old board file. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. It means there's a lot less pain in doing the migration to device tree. And the device tree append also gives us the option of having a, a migration path where if you don't have, if you're not able to modify the firmware, you can still get device tree support complete, remove the board file, but still support those, those boards with the older firmware. So then you need to write a skeletal device tree file that describes your system. This is a starting point. I'll show you what that looks like. And then you add a compatible string to the, the matching machine desk that will match against the value in the board file. So for this demonstration, I use, there's some links here. I will be posting these slides so you can get the link. But this is, I started with uh, booting up uh, the Versatile Express model in Ubuntu on the, with the Lenaro images. Uh, Versatile Express. I had been working with Versatile for a very long time, and last night I got this working. So all, all you need to do is uh, you need to turn on config OF and config OF DTB append. Uh, you make your Z image. You also make the DTB. This says DTB. It's actually DTB, so you'll see when I do that. And then you can concatenate them together. So why don't I show you? So what we have here First thing to show you is under boot options, button device tree support needs to be turned on. Uh, you want to have a pendant device tree, and you also want to supplement a pendant to DTB with traditional A tags. So this will, when you're working with something with older firmware, it will suck out the normal stuff that you absolutely must have, such as your memory size, your kernel command line, and your init RD location. And then the other thing that's useful is under device drivers. Uh, device tree and open firmware support. There's support for device tree and prop. This interface, I'm really hoping to rewrite because it's kind of ugly and I'd rather have it in SysFS. But it's been around for a long time. PowerPC has used it for a while. It will probably start becoming turned off by default, but it's never going to entirely go away because there is so much of the PowerPC ABI that depends on device tree and the prop file system. No, they're using this. In fact, I, the old PC, there's a new ARM old PC laptop that's in under development right now, and I was handed one yesterday, and I opened it up, and I looked in pocket, and sure enough, there's the device tree, because it uses open firmware, and it's using all the exact same infrastructure. They had a platform that helped them I think that's old. I don't think they're, I mean, if Chris is in the room, he'd be a, We did that for our previous laptops. We got feedback from mainline maintainers that we should be removing the device tree because we didn't have any compatibility worries with the new ARM version if we were able to just pick it from the state and have the ARM version. <coughs> yeah, and a lot of cleanup went in over the last year that really merged a lot of the, the both systems that use the Platinum device tree and systems that use open firmware and have a live device tree, which is subtly different, but in the early boot code, the kernel will get its device tree and use the common infrastructure once, it's been, once the device tree has been sucked out of the firmware. Okay, so what I would do is then I would do a do a build, so just set it to DTB, so this should take very little time because I compiled it before the presentation. And then here's the concatenation. So I'm just taking the Z image, I'm taking the Versatile Express DTB and squirting it into ZMH TTB. And then on QMU, uh, what you'll notice, there's dash M for Versatile Express, the CPU is a Cortex A9. Uh, if I had, uh, I could even set up for SMP, but I'm passing in that ZMH TTB. Just for demonstration, I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna pass the ZMH that I got from the build. So this is the Z image without the DTP appendage. And this will take a while. Uh, it's, 
uh, I'm using the, the disk image. I've noticed that this particular model takes quite a while to actually get user space to start. I haven't actually debugged this because I got the, this particular machine working last night. But what you will see, the first clue, and this is just a clue, is and about eight lines down, or it's the, the fifth line of kernel output where it's actually got a timestamp on it, you'll see uh, machine is ARM versus Tel Express. And that's all it says. So this is booting without the device tree, and if you look in prop, device tree. What's that? This is inside the virtual machine. There's nothing in prop device tree. So this is a regular standard boot. Now using exactly the same kernel, except this time, with the DTP appended. Now I should also mention, oops, small i, case sensitive file system. I should also mention that the, with the, with QMU, there's actually a lot of really good work that uh, Petalogix has done on the MicroBlaze platform which allows passing, you can actually specify in the Q, QMU command line, a DTB. And I've got a few patches that aren't uh, up, for, up to mainline yet that will allow you to do that with ARM as well. So you pass QMU to DTB, and it will use that to figure out what the machine model is, set up the model, and then move the kernel, passing it the same DTB. So you've got both an emulation model and a kernel model of the system that, that matches all the time. It's really cool with this, uh, with the stuff that Pedalogix has done because they've been working on FPGAs. And the FPGAs, of course, the hardware is whatever the hardware designer has scored in as a bit suit. And it allows them to, to actually do simulations of the FPGA mark, uh, the FPGA platform without actually having the FPGA. And John, you told me scary stories of testing on QMU and shipping it to customer with never running it off the old board. Okay, so the, the clue here, the one clue, is, it's not the clearest thing in the world, I'll probably end up changing these, but if you look at the machine line, about five lines down from the beginning, you'll notice that it's slightly different. You've got machine, the machine line is exactly the same, but you've also got a model tag. And the model is actually what comes out of the device tree. So if I go into prop device tree, We've actually got data in here now. Nope, I don't have that on here. And you'll notice that the string in the compatible property is exactly the same as what is, nope, that's not exactly the same. <laughs> because I used the wrong property. There it is. Now, you know, this is all well and good. It's really a trivial demo. It's not showing you a whole lot. Uh, the last time I gave a presentation like this, I actually had a Beagle board that I was doing device tree, and I had uh, a nunchuck, a Nintendo nunchuck wired up to I2C, and I was able to describe that with the, the DTP. And it, it was kind of fun, and I could show that the joystick worked. But this, this is really trivial. This shows you all you need to do to get up and running with the starting point. And once you've got that, then you've got this whole data structure that you can to start pocketing devices. And then if you actually take a look at a, a real board port, and I'll show off the versatile, because this is the one I've worked on the most. Let's just take a comparison of versatile PB and <coughs> Then you can start doing it. So this is versatile PB. This is a regular board support file. And what you see is you see an array of AMP device register. And this is going from all the AMP devices. Here's, here's the AMP devices right here. And in a lot of words, that's much larger. In fact, this also calls the common code that that blacklists an even larger set of devices. On the device tree support, the board file, the entirety of the board file looks like this. And all the data actually comes out of the device tree file with this one thing called. This is a very important function call if you're doing a board port. Is it a platform populate? Because that's where the kernel gets all its information about, uh, or that's how the kernel goes and starts locking the device tree, which kicks off 
creating devices, and then when drivers bind against those devices, those drivers can create some child devices. Yep, that's the next thing to show. Yes. Why is it even necessary to have a versatile DTLC? I mean, it isn't that itself completely generic. You know, there's a live stream. You know, it's a placeholder until you can describe everything in the live stream. I suspect that for each SOC family, you're still going to have one board file. You're still going to have. You still need to have, for each core set of support files, you still are going to have, need one of these machine start, machine end sections. Because this is what actually defines, uh, because this is what defines all your hooks. And when we get into multi-platform, there's enough complexity, we're never going to get down to a single set of common initializers. It's just not going to happen. There's too many differences. So instead, we still preserve the method of registering boards. But now what we can do, if you look at the device tree one, you notice it's DT machine start instead of machine start, which means you get rid of the device ID, or sorry, the machine ID. But what you'll see is it will have this DT compat list. And so you'll notice with this one, it's got two strings in there. And this particular board file will match against the device tree passed in that either has the versatile AV or the versatile PV string in the top level compatible string. And so now to show what the actual device tree looks like, th this is it. Now the first thing you'll notice is this one actually includes all the stuff from the versatile AV, because the PV is a superset of the AV. And we've got a bus, and we've got platform devices on that bus, and then there's an FPGA, which also has devices in it. This one isn't as interesting because by including this file, I got a lot of the boilerplate from the AV version. So instead, let's take a look at the AV version. Okay, and you'll see some interesting things in here. First of all, there's that string that I showed you, that clue that device tree support's actually working. Uh, you've got a, a compatible string. <coughs> compatible is absolutely key when you're working with device tree. It is how the kernel decides what drivers to bind against what devices. It's how the kernel decides which board support to use for the capacity device tree. It is actually a list. Uh, most, uh, yeah, you can see some here. It's a list from most, more compatible to least compatible, so that you can specifically say, this is absolutely an ARM PL011 device but it's also compatible with the ARM client cell binding. And you'll see that a lot. So for new devices, if it's binary, if it's register level compatible, you definitely want to include the compatible string for the previous device so that existing device drivers will work. You'll also see, I'm not gonna talk about the format of this, you can find the documentation online, but you will see there's a property for memory. There is a, uh, you know, there's, this flat one, that's a uh, property for a flat device. There's a question here? Yes, I just saw a FPGA Yes. Is it possible to initialize the SPGA with the recipe? You know what, it would be. If that was appropriate, it would be absolutely okay to have a property that contains the bit stream for the FPGA. I won't say whether or not that's a good idea. Right, because you've got to, you're going to need to make those decisions based on your application, and um, based on on the, on the with this, you know, it might very well make sense. I don't know if the Versatile Express actually has the ability to load it from the from the CPU. Yeah. I mean, the, the other way to do it, because bit streams are very large, and you might not want to have it in your machine description is to be able to say, this is what the FPGA is, this is how it's configured, and call out to a firmware loader in user space. Use the firmware loading interface to load the device, load the, uh, load the image. Now, so one of the interesting research product, projects that Xilinx has been working on is they actually have a, a device tree fragment reader where you can, from user space, pass into SysFS, hey, here's a fragment of the device tree. And this describes an FPGA. So you'd be able to, in their FPGA loading, you load the bit stream, 
and then you load the description of it, and the kernel can then go and register all the devices. And then when you tear it down, I, it would be relatively straightforward to also then tear down all those devices, throw away the device tree fragment, and clear the bitstream. John. Uh, we have not been using CPU nodes. Uh, when we start, we might add them. Because in AMP configured, in AMP, or async, um, asymmetric multiprocessing, it's important to get information about the CPUs. We haven't needed them yet. And that was the first device trees that were created did have the CPUs node and enumeration trees the CPUs. But Rob Herring, we had a talk about Rob Herring brought up the point that. On the, all the existing platforms, we can detect it. And if we, can, if we can detect the hardware, detecting the hardware is always better than this. But that's why we generally don't uh, we generally don't describe device tree uh, PCI buses or USB buses unless there's something that we can't detect. If we can't detect it, then we definitely want to have the have that in there. Uh, looks like I've got about 10 minutes left, so I could take, take more questions. Okay. Okay, so clock support we can't talk about unless we're also talking about the common struct clock. Common struct clock, for those of you who uh, haven't been following it, is every single ARM sub-architecture defines its own set, its own clock structure and defines its own set of accessors. It basically completely prevents being able to build a single kernel with support for more than one SSC. There's a, an effort underway to consolidate that, uh, that clock support so that we don't need to do that anymore. That is, right now, Mike, what's Mike's last name? Do you have? He's been doing some, he picked up the work. For a long time, there was uh, Jeremy Kerr and uh, Linus Walsh had both been working on it. They just didn't have time because they got wrapped up with other stuff. So it languished for a long time. Mike's actually working on it, so there's actually some forward progress. And he's got some patches that look reasonable. I'm really hoping that it gets merged in 3.3. It's, it's missed the 3.2 merge window, but we got momentum, so I'm hoping it'll get queued up soon. Right after that, we actually need to come up with the binding. And then there's the questions about how do we actually describe this? How much of the data do we describe? It also brings up the question of do we describe the internal clocks of the SOC in C code? Or do we put it into the device tree? Or if we put it into the device tree, how much do we expand? Do we try to expand every internal clock in the SOC? Or is that overkill? Maybe we should just be describing all the clocks in the system as a single device or a, a small number of devices that have lost budgets. You know, these, these, are, these, these are the hard questions, and these are being worked on right now. I can't even say what the clock binding is going to look like, because that's not the area that I'm looking at. Mike is going to be better at that. He's going to be able to describe that better. And it's you know, you, you focus on OMAP, but I'll have a better idea. Or sorry, uh, uh, not you, but uh, folks on OMAP can look at that. Other questions? Boost speed isn't affected at all. <coughs> I measured it. It's, it's completely in the noise. So is I mean, the data structure is really easy part. Now, having said that, was some of the experiments that were actually using large amounts of data to populate clock structures that took a long time. So individual bindings could end up chewing up a lot of CPU time, but for any of the device processing, the stuff that we're doing now it was completely negligible. It's, it should be faster, but there's less code that we need, so a lot of the, the code ends up being caught in the cache. Uh, the data for the device tree is small enough that uh, a lot of it was probably caught in the cache when you're doing it, and the algorithm for actually processing the device tree. Yeah, I mean, it, it can very easily become an n squared or an n cubed operation if you've got a poor algorithm for actually parsing the tree. 
a lot of the algorithms are quite dumb, just because there's been no speed benefited in making them faster yet. Yeah, there's lots of room for optimization there, and with new bindings and actually bringing it requires them. It's, it's going to be important to be careful if you're dealing with really big data structures. No different from anything else. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I I can't tell you off the top of my head. I looked at it, I just can't remember. So it wasn't huge. It was, um, I think for the object code, just to add in device to support was 50 ish I'm not sure. I, I, I would really need to do it again. I think do it right after the session to uh, pull up those numbers. It wasn't, it wasn't anything that really It is completely freeform. It's the, the data structure, all of the all of the offsets and pointers are 32 bit integers. So if you create a device tree that's four gig in size, you'd start having problems. Uh, I would argue you'd already have problems if you're creating a four gig <laughs> device tree. There is very purposely the properties are named are key value pairs, and the properties are strings. We've got a namespace on the compatible strings. So you always put the prefix of the manufacturer on the string. That has turned out to work very well so that we don't have collisions. And for any one, any individual device, there are some properties that have very well defined purposes. So I'll show an example, or I'll try to find an example. Okay, I don't have a great example here, but we'll use this node. This GPIO node. Uh, reg has a very well-defined behavior. Interrupts is very well-defined, and most device nodes have that. And then you'll start seeing, for this particular compatible string, ARM 9, PL960611, all these strings are documented, by the way. Anytime a new bind gets added to the kernel, it is an absolute requirement that documentation gets added as to what property names are expected and which ones are optional. And it will say, it will have a GPIO controller property. It will have uh, a number of GPIO cells property, and that one says for a GPIO specifier on this node how many U32s are needed to completely specify the interrupt. It's also an interrupt controller, and the number of cells, the number of U32s required to describe an interrupt on this device is two. Can we pass on the tables? Can you have tables? Absolutely. It's just data. Okay, so what's the way that it works is in your binding, you'll say this property name means X or Y. And in your binding, you'll say this is the format of that data. So if it's tuples, a table of tuples, <coughs> yeah, that works great. It can hold pretty much any arbitrary data. OK, I've got two minutes left. So maybe a couple more questions. Go ahead. Um, one absolutely possible, the tool is immature. So we do have static check in the device tree compiler, but it doesn't do a lot of it, and the tools, there's no doubt that the tools have to be improved. Maybe one more question? Maybe one, one thing that happens um, in the device tree is that the No, there's, 
there's no ordering and coherence in the device tree on, on the device. It's a static model. Uh, however, if I put, now is it ordering of which devices get loaded? Initialization ordering of devices? That's something that has been a long-standing problem in the kernel, that we don't have a way of devices representing, like drivers that are having dependencies between devices that don't fit the tree. And in fact, when drivers get loaded, even if like, there is all that's wrong. It's actually link order of the drivers that has more impact on when drivers get probed than order that they're registered. But we've got a patch. There's a fix for that, and that's a bird probe. And I think for a lot of that, you'll be able to have the deferred probe. Uh, you, a driver will be able to say, I'm not ready yet. And then you can code into your driver instead of your board support code. So. And we can do that. And for individual devices, we can describe, you know, we've got a dependency here. Don't start until this device is ready. Yeah, that was good. I'm having the stop sign waved at me, so thank you very much, and I'm asking questions afterwards.